photographer Janusz Kaminski. about the way things were happening in the world and the country, and Liz Hanna, 31 years old, writes a spec script, gets it to Amy Pascal, who sends it to me, and suddenly my entire outlook on the future brightened. <laughs> Overnight. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was there on paper, and uh, I just felt that there was an urgency to to reflect 1971 and 2017 because it was very uh, terrifyingly similar. Um, Liz, Catherine Graham has a wonderful memoir, but it's it's very long. It, it follows her sort of amazing life. How did you choose this moment to focus on? Um, I think for me, this was her coming of age story, and and that's what I connected to. Um, I think often the coming of age story happens when you're 17, and I fingers crossed none of us actually became the person we were going to be when we were 17 years old. Yeah. Um, but there is something very relatable to a woman finding her voice, um, to a woman standing in a room of men and being out talked, um, overlooked, and her having to make that decision, and not only make the decision. Um, for her family, for her company, but for herself, that she was now going to stand on her own two feet. And that felt, um, for me, very relevant and very something that I just personally connected to, and so that's where it started. Um. Meryl, there's a scene early in the movie where Catherine Graham is hosting a dinner party, and the conversation turns to like Nixon's China policy or something, and the women excuse themselves. The implication, I guess, being they wouldn't be interested or they shouldn't be. Um, how do you think the era in which Catherine Graham lived shaped her as a leader, and, and how did it shape the way you performed her? You know, that was customary in um, certain circles uh, of powerful people. That uh, There's a scene just like it in the film I made about Margaret Thatcher, same thing happened uh, habitually, that when the people would have a dinner party and when the um, important topics came up, the women would excuse themselves and go talk about <coughs> handbags or whatever, <laughs> in Margaret Thatcher's case, I guess. But yeah, that's the way it was. And in fact, there was a, this is based on a, a real thing that happened. We didn't put it in the film, ultimately, but. She went to a dinner at, at Joe Alsop's house, who was a, a famous uh, columnist and very well connected across the aisle of both uh, uh, very powerful people. And that moment came up when the women left, were supposed to leave. And <clears throat> she went to Joe and she said, you know, I think I'm going to go home now instead of because I don't really want to do the, that. And he said, how can you do that? He was very offended, and she, she just said, I'm, I'm going to leave. And she went home, and that ended the practice in Washington. Mm. Word traveled around the city, and they stopped doing it. 
the women got to stay. So that was her, a very tiny revolt that she made then. But how did it run? That was well, a <laughs> How did it change the way you play her? Because you play her as someone who's somewhat uncertain as she's stepping into these boardrooms. She was very uncertain, and it's in, in her book, she talks a lot about, about that. And her, her son, who I uh, spoke with, Don Graham, and her daughter, they, they almost talk about nothing else. Because how you are at home, too, you reveal yourself maybe more to your kids. But at work, she had so much, so many people thinking that she didn't deserve to be where she was. And, you know, we know she, how, what a brilliant woman she turned out to be, and a brilliant uh, businesswoman and a leader, first uh, head of a Fortune 500 company who was female. So she she earned her bona fides on her own. But oh man, what what the world was like? I try to tell young women who weren't alive then, how different it was very recently. <laughs> very recently. And it still is in those leadership circles. You know? They're still pretty much, they, we, we filled up the bottom of the pyramid, but right here, where it all gets decided, yeah. we're not, we don't have parity, we don't, we're not even close. We're still at 17%, you know, major boards and every other thing. So. Yeah, it's relevant to today. <laughs> um, Tom, you had the opportunity to talk to some people who knew Bradley, including his widow Sally Quinn and others. What kinds of things did you learn that were helpful to you? Well, I actually had had dinner and lunch a couple of times with with Ben uh, in the '90s. I met, I met him, and he and Sally through through Nora Ephron, and he was still Ben Bradley, very much so. He he had dementia in the in the in the later years of his life, but at that time, he was. The man. There was just no doubt about it. And Sally was a seasoned veteran of uh, Washington circles and journalism, uh, almost as much as he was. So the the command that he had of a room and the ability uh, I, the the man I met was uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? He was curious. He was interested in what was going on and what you had to say. A conversation with him flew by and jumped from topic to topic. He wasn't. He didn't pontificate. He didn't. He didn't tell war stories. If you ask him a question about, you know, who was who was deep throat, he'd ah, bah, you know, it could have been so and so. I don't know. Maybe it was. Maybe it was I don't know. Mark felt. Who knows? But you know, Tom. La, 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 la. So you, you get onto something, something else. And because I had known him, the, I heard him speak when I read his book, A Good Life. And to see all the video that, that had been sent to me that I was able to found, uh, find, I was extremely familiar with this vigor and gusto he had for the job of being a reporter. He would, he would talk about uh, running a small newspaper in New England when he was first starting out with as much verve and as much alacrity as he was talking about the, the, in his battles trying to turn the Washington Post into the number one newspaper in Washington. Because in fact, the Washington Star was a much bigger newspaper than the Post was. Bigger circulation, bigger ad revenue, what have you. Um, so I was, I, was, uh, I was lucky that I had this brush with the man and had him a concept of his countenance. Because as Ann Roth noted, and, and a few other people said, that man owned the room when he, when he walked, whatever room it was. That man owned the room because he was just, he was not the guy in charge, but he was the most interested person at the table, in the office, uh, in the boardroom. Uh, and uh, that, that was, uh, that was he, he, said, uh, he said one great thing that, uh, well, you know, well, you know, the job got to be hard. You know, well, they made that movie, you know. <laughs> of course, the first thing anybody says, well, you don't look like Jason Robards. <laughs> you know, so even that, there was, there was a, com a complete understanding of that. He proved, his, he proved himself a member of the Fourth Estate with every single day and every single story. 
and what happened before didn't matter and what was going to happen come after. You had to get the story right, because otherwise if you're wrong, you have to eat it for 24 hours, and it doesn't taste good. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, for those in the room who don't know, also uh, wrote another movie about the Fourth Estate, uh, Spotlight. And you spent a lot of time in, in newsrooms. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> for allowing print journalists to set up a little straighter. Um, what kinds of things did you do when you came on board this film? What kinds of things did you add to the script or changes did you make? I mean, really, uh, uh, first of all, I was just thrilled to be invited to the party. Uh, I mean, Liz had written the best spec script I'd ever read in my life. I think it's the best spec script that's ever I've been, been written. I've been money for the last month. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's good, good. You know, we writers, you know, it's good. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and so I was just trying to help out. Uh, I mean, I think that... Um, you know, one thing that's amazing about working with Stephen and everybody else on this stage is that you have a lot of people who want to uh, jump in and help you. Um, and so we were able to suddenly have access to Don Graham uh, and Lally Graham and other members of the family. and. And uh, we also were able to uh, talk to Lynn Downey, who took over from Ben Bradley and, you know, was at the Post at the time. We went down to the Post and we got all these great stories from people who had worked with Kay and Ben. Uh, and just, uh, just to try to, um, you know, try to really, you know, uh, nail, nail the story. Uh, uh, but so, you know, for me, uh, what I loved about um, jumping in here is, you know, Spotlight uh, is really a, a reporter's story, right? It's really about getting the story. It's not about whether to publish. It's about really, you know, when are we going to publish, right? This is about whether to publish, and it's really a story about a publisher, right? And, and what Liz had done so brilliantly in that script uh, was she had married this sort of big issue um, uh, with, you know, this very personal story of a woman finding her voice. And so it was just thrilling to be able to, you know, chip in to the extent I could. Um, I love that newsroom. I love the rotary phones and the Rolodexes and the typewriters. I wish I could work in it. How did you create it? Where, where's that building? What is it? There's a building in, in White Plains uh, that we picked. And that was because um, there was no way we were going to be able to build a set in time. And I also knew that having worked with Steve and I wanted to just put him to work and have him come to an office building, ride an elevator up, and then have everybody just come to work. And then the amazing thing was that uh, the group in, in New York um, that we got to work with, with Rena D'Angelo, the set decorator and the art directors and props, we all took it very personally, but that group in particular really, uh, they, they took every step that could possibly be taken actually led by Amy Pascal and, and also uh, Christy, we would always report to them and they would make openings for us to research and go to the, the sources and everybody in New York, it was just the right place to make this movie because everybody cared so much. So that what you see in that newsroom, and it's not the same as all the presidents done because that's the next iteration after the Washington Post was successful during this period. but. The most important thing for me was to be able to find the social side of the of the um, the world in the newspaper in the office, but also the intimate side, of Kay Graham's house, Ben Bradley's house, and all the the basically you know when you talk about the man in the room, almost all those are men's rooms. I don't mean in the urinal way, but a little bit. <laughs> anyway, I'm not really answering the question, but to me the art direction doesn't it it's there to serve. And I just feel thrilled that the, that the people in front of the camera, who were the characters, were able to draw upon it. But also I know that the crew that I had gave everything that they could. Um, Janusz, this feels like a 70s movie, and I don't just mean that it's set in the 70s. I mean it feels like it's shot in the 70s. Can you talk about what kinds of decisions you guys made? Okay, I think, from my perspective, once you put people in the proper costumes and proper wardrobe, and provide the camera with the right elements, it's really easy for me to create a time period. I mean, it's, it's really not that complicated. You know, we have to do 360 all the time because that's how Stephen 
um, stage of the scene, but other than that, my job was rather busy. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great story to work on with great actors, so it's really, it's easy, kind of easy. <laughs> so modest. Uh, <laughs> it is, it's so beautiful. It's beautifully designed, beautifully written, beautifully performed. I'm lucky here, here I am emigrant, bad hombre kind of, making this movie, you know. So it was great. Stephen, would you like to talk about why it, it, it does feel like it was shot in the settings? I mean, the sort of visual language of it feels, feels like that. Well, you know, there wasn't, look, there wasn't a lot of time to um, storyboard or previs or all those things we, we, we usually do with bigger movies. There was really only enough time to, for Rick to present all of us with locations that were authentic to the period. And as the honor said, Anne Roth's costume, the hair design, the makeup, everything else that contributed to the look of the styles of the 70s. Because um, we were all shooting from the hip. Um, and that was what was interesting and spontaneous about making the movie because there were no good, I didn't have a shot list. I had a great script, I had a great cast. And uh, every single morning I just found ways to keep it moving, keep it tense and taut. I knew this was a thriller. A, 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 not just a story about investigative journalists and, and, and the morality of the truth, but it was a really, really, you know, newsroom adventure story, and I wanted to keep the pacing going so I could create a level of suspense leading up to the two huge decisions that Catherine Graham had to make. Um, and the look, okay, I use the zoom lens, okay? That's a 1970s tool. I zoom. I zoom. Every once in a while, I zoom. <laughs> that was it. I don't, I don't get kudos you, for that. You were, you were, you were groomed to Zoom. <laughs> so it had all the sophistication of an episode of The Name of the Game. <laughs> I zoomed in that too. Bracken's, Bracken's World, you know, one of the shows of the seven. And some very uh, loving close-ups of the printing press. Where, yeah. where did you find that and how did you decide to shoot it? That is a line-of-type facility in White Plains, New York, that when you go to New York and you see a play, and you get your playbill, when you open the playbill up, those are the machines that print all your playbills in New York City, all of them, in this one facility. And we were able to go in there and get super macro close-ups of the whole process. And when they first showed me how this worked, I couldn't believe it. I said, how long have you been doing this? Oh, 400 years. <laughs> we used wood before tintype and probably stone and a little axe before that, but this was one of the oldest, you know, you know uh, means of putting print on, on surfaces. And I, I couldn't get enough of it. Matter of fact, what you saw in the movie is only about a third of what I shot. <laughs> I was obsessed with that <laughs> But I've got a really good outtake reel, if anybody wants to see it. <laughs> when the DVD comes out, I'll put it on the outtake reel. Tom, I understand that before shooting started, you had a bunch of the people who were playing the reporters and editors to lunch? Yeah, everybody asked me what it's like to work with Stephen, and so I said, look, come over, we'll have some pie. Uh, uh, and I'll, ex I'll explain the way the guy works. Um, and uh, everybody came over. Um, and uh, the, literally everybody who was in the newsroom. Um, not me. Not you, no, because you were the boss. There's the people who were in the, in the newsroom. Uh, we invited one lady, Carrie Coon, she got to come. Um, and the discussion was, everybody has this, you know, this sense that when Stephen arrive, arrives on the set, you know, no one's allowed to look at him. <laughs> And he tells you, he turns your face, and says, you will say the line and turn your faces, but, uh, and it's not like that. I, the way I explain it is, look, there's, there's no rehearsal. Um, our job is to show up on time, to know our lines, the dialogue as it is, and to be flexible to go in any direction that we might have, because Stephen loves actors acting. He wants you to come in with ideas, and they'll say, really? I said yes, and he will also throw at you stuff that you can't even begin to imagine right now. That will happen most days, and then other days you will come and all of your work will be done for you. There is some shock, there is some concept that means all we have to do is inhabit those moments, 
mm-hmm. and it will it will be in the film. And the, the best example of it, I think, is we had this, we had a scene that actors love because there's five or six of us in it, and we're all sitting around talking about, ah, oh, you're burying the lead there. Well, you put that in the second graph of crying out loud. What are we a novel that you could be able to type this kind of? Why don't you get your book and get out and do? We had this all this fabulous. Liz Hanna and 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 Jesse, you know, front page kind of jargon that we were throwing around, and we were in heaven, and we kept waiting for Stephen to come in with a camera, and he never really did because it was shooting a guy with a shoebox full of papers, <laughs> and suddenly a scene that we thought was about us arguing about how to make the paper became a story about a guy with a shoebox with papers, and that's the type of thing. All we had to do was inhabit a moment. And the real important, it wasn't about us, it was about the shoebox full of papers. And so that was Ella, that was raised up. And the fellow who played the guy with the shoebox, he didn't know he was going to do that that day. He was just a guy at a desk, you know, uh, kind of like a glorified dress extra. Maybe, did he even have a line in the screenplay? He had a line in the screenplay, I think, but I gave him most of the lines on the set that day. And that Josh was giving me to give to him. And he was also a New York City detective. <laughs> He's great. <laughs> and, and this is a very large ensemble cast. How how did you assemble this group so quickly? This is the most amazing thing for me in the story because so often when I when I make a movie, I have my first choices, and it's not always. I don't always get my first choices in my films, uh, sometimes due to availability and sometimes due to the fact that actors don't like the script enough to say yes to me or to any of us. So this was an amazing thing. Every, oh, 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 <laughs> but everybody that I wanted in the movie, they were available, and they all said yes. And so it, every first choice is in the film. There's nobody that, ah, I wish I could have gotten her, but what about her? It, all the first choices said yes. And it, we cast it very quickly. I have to give uh, just my thanks and gratitude to an amazing casting director who I could not have made this movie without. Her name's Ellen Lewis. And, and Ellen reached deep uh, in, into not only the people that I was hoping to work with. I've, I've known Bradley Whitford for 20 years. I've always wanted to work with him. I had the shot to do it this time. Bruce Greenwood, I've known for a long time, never worked with him, got a shot to work with him. But then Ellen went to Broadway Theater, off Broadway Theater, and she pulled some great, great people off the boards uh, who I never knew, knew about and brought them all in. So it was just one of my favorite, I think, cast pictures I've, I've worked on. Um, Mary, can you can you tell us about the scene where um, Catherine Graham is on the phone with I don't know five or six men and she's making her decision? And what was that like to shoot? How did you decide to play it? <laughs> well, the boys were all in a little tent off off uh, set, and they were not in character. And um, I came in to shoot the scene, and they're all in there having a fabulous time, like a little, a, a sweat lodge or something. It's really sort of nasty in there. And uh, I didn't realize, I didn't think they realized the seriousness of what I was going to have to be doing. But they were, they were hilarious. But Stephen had, you had said originally, <clears throat> I think I'm, I'm going to shoot this. The thing about you is, that really surprised me, was how improvisatory and um, spontaneous and living the process of making the movie is. That, I wasn't prepared for, I was, you know, I'd never worked with, with, with Stephen and, um, Tom had, obviously, like 150 times, and, <laughs> and it was kind of, uh, you know, there was a, in a way, there was a boy story and a girl story in this, and, um, and I was kind of, I felt a little bit isolated and 
out of the fun, out of the sweat lodge. I wasn't invited to the, you know, the pie. <laughs> I guess that was manipulative of you. <laughs> yes. But I'm just, I'm so impressed with how free you, you were on, on the script. But anyway, originally you said you were going to shoot that all, uh, just, he said, I'm, I'm just going to shoot it on your face, the whole thing, the whole thing on your face. I said, oh, good Lord. Like, you know, 20 years ago, maybe. <laughs> but, but then the, the, the voices, um, he wanted to see them living, and he wanted to orchestrate it differently, and so it, it changed, and, and um, where the camera was, I never knew where it was going to be, you know, he's coming out from here, he's here, he's all around, he's moving, and it was uh, kind of thrilling. I mean, I'm so old and jaded, but I just, I got so excited coming to work every day, I really did, I thought, man. Beautifully, and I thought it was really surprising how how Catherine Graham reacted, how she finally ultimately made the decision. Well, that was from her her book. I did I did really rely on her book as a, a bible of her interior life because she's so eloquent about the emotions that led up to it. And she, and she did say in her book that there was just a moment where she just went blank and and said what she said, you know. Let's do it, let's do it, let's publish. But almost in a void, uh, you know, so many things led up to it. But in the moment just before, there's a great documentary I saw once about the first, uh, the last eight seconds before Olympic athletes go. It, it, did anybody see this? And that's all it was. The whole documentary was just the, the eight seconds before people would take a, a dive or get up off the mark and it, it, it reminded me of that moment. It was mm. just everything concentrated into yes, you know, mm. and that, that uh, I remembered it when, when I was going in to shoot it and then they ruined it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did not. We, what happened was a bunch, a bunch of guys were essentially treating it like a day off because we could wear our shorts and flip-flops that day. Sitting in that little blue tent, we had no idea that we were providing an audio track for what was going to be one of the most important moments in a motion picture that I've seen all the years. We, we felt as though we just barely glanced onto greatness there by hanging out in our little fart-filled blue tent. <laughs> Did you decide how to shoot the Nixon scenes? Well, I had been aware of the uh, of the Nixon tapes based on the release, of, of, uh, you know, during the Freedom of Information Act, and I had been uh, and I, Josh and I talked about this, and I just said, why don't we let Nixon play himself in the movie? He's available <laughs> uh, and, and accessible, very accessible. He was your first. He was my first choice. <laughs> <laughs> And so, and it, it, so the idea was, we, uh, my first idea was, and Josh and I discussed, and Liz discussed this with us too, about letting Nixon just be a voiceover, just hearing his voice. But I really felt that we needed to see him. And uh, so I asked Rick, can you build, can I see him through a window like there's a camera, you know, with a zoom lens, by the way, because I zoomed on the shot. Uh, <laughs> Slowly zooming in, and he's in the White House, and he's in his Oval Office, and he's talking on the phone. So Rick built the entire facade of the Oval Office on the back lot where we were shooting at Steiner Studios. And we shot at one dusk because Janusz wanted some ambient in the air, so it wasn't just you know shot with arc lights, but it was actually some sky ambience on the white facade of the uh, Oval Office. And we just did the shooting that way, and we got a wonderful actor, about 86, 87 years old, uh, who um, never played Nixon before, but had a striking resemblance to Nixon, and was able to listen to the tapes, and saw a lot of uh, uh, file footage on Richard Nixon, and was able to find the hunched shoulders, and the gestures, and 
you know, you know, um, don't tell my wife because she'll let the Washington Post in. All of that stuff he studied, and then we shot it in about, um, you know, an hour. Another actor gets this moment in the Steven Spielberg movie. He thought he was like, oh, I've got to play the back of Nixon's head. And instead, he gets this fantastic moment that, uh, that is going to live forever in the Steven Spielberg movie. Well, Nixon, you know, didn't live forever, but 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 he um, wham wham. But, <laughs> but the, the thing of it was, you know, here's the other thing. You know, I'm not going to consider defend Richard Nixon, um, but you know, this this uh, opportunity to read Ben Bradley's book, to read Catherine Graham's book, I got a chance to read the Richard Nixon book, which came out, you know, recently. And for all of his paranoia and all the things that really self-destructed and, and where he, sh he didn't have enough feet to shoot himself in, but he did it all the time. Pretty brilliant guy when you really uh, Started sit the back and, Yeah, you, you, you really read his contributions. Uh, you, know, you, have to, you have to look at both sides of this. Invented the Republican cloth coat. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, huh? <laughs> How old are you people? <laughs> Remember the checker speech for guts? What did you say, Liz? You said uh, try to get universal health care passed. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Um, as you said, you went to great lengths to finish this movie this year. Who is your intended audience? Who do you really hope sees it? Besides this fine folks right here. Oh, I think our intended audience are the people who have spent uh, you know, basically the last, you know, 13, 14 months thirsting and starving for the truth. <laughs> and, and, and they're out there, they're out there, and, and, and they're out there, and they need some good news, and if they have to look back to 1971 to find it, and then to compare it with the great pendulum swings, and the thing about a pendulum is it always swings back. Yeah, yeah it always swings back. Thank you for quenching our thirst. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys, for being here.